So welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, this uh, talk is about um, Storm. We recently did a pretty big release of uh, Storm, uh, Storm 2.0, and there's been a long list of features in there. Um, one of the big ones was a uh, re-architected core engine uh, designed around performance, uh, and that's some of the work I've been involved with. Um, my name is Roshan Naik. I currently work at Uber, uh, a lead on the streaming platform team there. Okay, so um, this talk I'm going to mostly focus um, on the, the the new architecture as well as the um, uh, performance of it. Uh, I think there's a talk later on uh, by Kishore. I think he's got coverage for some of the other stuff that's gone into Storm 2.0. So uh, what's new in the core, in this new core? Uh, it has a new messaging subsystem, which is lock-free. Uh, it has a linear threading model. Um, basically, we have a lot fewer threads uh, doing more work, better utilization of the cores. Uh, a brand new back pressure model, uh, kind of calling it a bubble up back pressure. Uh, this is very lightweight and designed to sustain uh, the max throughput your system can achieve even under back pressure, because when under back pressure you don't want to throttle it too much, because then your backlog will build up. In the Storm 1.0 line, the core was a mixture of Java and Clojure code. Uh, the core messaging queues was in uh, Java and some other stuff. The code around it was in uh, Java. I'm sorry, in Clojure. Uh, now it's basically um, the new architecture is all Java. Uh, performance has been very fundamental right from the beginning uh, of this redesign. And um, very important is the fact that it, is, it remains backward compatible. Um, I'll jump right into the demo. So to choose kind of how to demo the performance, uh, there was something that was needed to be simple to see and understand, but at the same time challenging uh, to showcase the performance. So, uh, so I was wondering how to kind of do that. And the thought I had was, okay, let's try something that's outside the normal bounds of stream computing. Uh, typically, uh, so this one I'm going to do is some video processing. Um, normally, streaming engines, you don't do stream processing with them because they're not, you don't have a lot of GPU-centric stuff currently built on them. So this is kind of taking stream engines to the little, you know, outside of their comfort zone. Uh, I've got an instance of Storm running. I'm going to launch a topology here. Now, the challenge with this uh, demo is that I've got screen capture running on the side. So hopefully that doesn't mess it all up because it has its own load that it puts on the system. Uh, let me see. Okay. So the topology has been submitted. It's about to launch. So this is basically live. What the topology is doing is uh, it's got a spout, which is capturing uh, the images from my camera on the laptop. There's a bolt. Uh, so basically, it's taking those images and cloning them into downstream bolts. Uh, there are three parallel downstream bolts, each one doing a different kind of image processing. So you can see the first one on the left is tracking my face. You can see the red square around my face, so it's doing face detection. The next one is doing edge detection. And the last one is doing um, a black and white transform. So you can see it's you know handling that pretty well. 
So there's basically uh, the transforming bolt is sending the image, it's cloning the image and sending that to us another downstream bolt which is handling the display. So there's a spout which is capturing the image, a bolt which is doing the image processing, and then finally another bolt which is doing the, um, the display. Okay, so, so the reason for this is here you can actually see the throughput and latency. If you have issues, you can actually easily spot it. On my screen, it's actually much smoother than what you see there because I think the network and all of that is um, kind of uh, introducing some lags. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is actually try to push this a little bit further. So I'm gonna kill this topology here and then submit it. So let's see uh, three, so I'll try to have uh, nine. So basically I'm putting more pressure on the system now. And submitted, it's coming up. And So yeah, we have f five above and four below. So basically there's three of each kind of transforms going on and it's still tracking fairly well. You can see on your screen, I think the kind of lag and jitter is about, probably about the same as it was before because of the network traffic. But let me see if I can turn this around and show you. Um, can see it. Uh, I think it's probably too small for you guys to see there, but actually it's here pretty smooth. Uh, so I'm going to try to push it a little bit more. So I'm going to try 18. I'm going to push it like really hard. So 18 means three of them, so you kind of get six of each of those things. So the spout is cloning to 18 downstream bolts, which are then sending it to another 18 downstream bolts to display that. So you can see it's still holding up, right? It's on my screen, the thing is still the same. Probably the lag on here is, I think, the same. It can still track my face, the age detection, and the black and white. And it actually has capacity to do more. But um, right now, actually, Storm is fast enough to easily handle this one. Uh, right now, much of this processing power is being consumed actually by the bolts doing the transforms, uh, the image processing. 
in terms of you know moving these messages around it's uh, fairly easy for storm to handle so yeah so that kind of is a simple visual way to actually see uh the performance in action um so yes that is kind of the storm performance demo for you okay so switching over to the slides did i kill it yes i did so uh, before talking about performance, I wanted to put a little bit of a perspective around performance. Um, uh, some of the motivating factors, some perspectives. Um, so how do you know what is the, well, the most fundamental question in performance would be, what do you mean by high performance? Uh, when do you know a system is fast? Uh, so one of the ways that's been classically done is by comparing one system with another saying that this one is faster than the other one, therefore this is fast. But um, a better way to do it is actually to compare it with the hardware potential instead. Because if, you know, everyone's average, you know, if it's better than average, you're not really great. And we'll talk about this later because this is one of the fundamental parts that occurred at the very initial design of Storm uh, 2.0 uh, to look into the hardware potential. The primary dimensions for performance, throughput, latency, uh, resource utilization, and energy. Some topologies care about, uh, some jobs will care about throughput, others latency, some both, and some none. But usually there's always a business case for the second two, meaning better utilization of resources and lower energy consumption because that's money. Storm has been known for its latency uh, for a while. The thing is that throughput you can always get by putting more workers, more you know, scaling horizontally. But latency you can't really get as simply, right? There's a limit and that's it. You have to kind of work within it. So your system uh, puts a boundary on that. There's a bunch of use cases with different ranges of uh, latency critical, uh, you know, applications for different ranges I've listed here. The more interesting, probably the tightest ones are in the high frequency trading systems where they classify a fast system in case they're using Java. as uh, Something that's under 100 microseconds latency, 90% of the time and no garbage collection during trading hours. For these guys running a slow system, letting it run is like losing money. So they rather stop something like that and not have it run. So this is a small snapshot into the insights into how you look into the gap in the hardware potential versus what the current systems have to offer. So this is an analysis I had done a few years ago uh, when I was just starting out the work. If you, um, so the, the fundamental thing here is to come up with a good experiment that tells you what is the boundary, what is the limit of the hardware potential. So the choice is kind of important. For streaming systems, it's actually simple. Because streaming systems, and I mean true streaming systems, not micro-batch stuff. Uh, basically, when you have true streaming systems, you have operators running on different threads, and data is kind of flowing through them. So basically, it's stripped down to its very core. It's basically just threads passing messages. Right, That's the very core of it. So then the... Then the experiment is all about how fast you can move um, messages between threads because that's the upper limit. The engines will typically have to do some more stuff around it, so they're going to slow down from that uh, kind of a limit. So now how do you measure that? So 
I benchmark some of the low level primitives like volatile locks, atomics and lazy sets and so forth, which are used to build these message queues used for message passing. And then finally looked at the message queues themselves. And I was running some of these experiments on my previous laptop. So I got a sense of, okay, what is a kind of, you know, that machine's rough throughput. So um, the first uh, row there is basically a very simple, it's just one thread. It's got a simple array queue, an array DQ, the Java one, and all it's doing is it's um, reading one element out of the queue and putting it back in. So just doing that in a loop, okay? just one thread, no concurrency. And array DQ, as you know, is not a thread safe anyway. It, it could do a billion reads per second. You just replace that queue with a lock-based queue, array blocking queue, and it goes down to 30 million per second. So you can see the cost of locks is huge, right? And there's no concurrency yet. There's just one thread just you know, in a loop, inserting and putting elements back. The, when you add a producer and a consumer so that the inserts are happening on a, one thread and consumer is on a different thread, it falls down significantly to four million per second. So array, array, uh, lock-based queues are very expensive. Concurrency is expensive. So then I tried the disruptor queue, which is what the Storm 1.x line uses. And uh, with one producer and one consumer, uh, it was able to achieve about 25 million per second. Um, so the, the so disruptor has decent performance, uh, but it has one significant problem. It's uh, extraordinarily difficult to understand and use. If I were to give you a array list or ask you to design one, I'm sorry, a queue, uh, you know, you would expect their one method to insert items, another one to pull items out of it. You will not find that in Disruptor. If you want to do something as simple as that, you need to go through, I think I counted about 13 different concepts you need to wrap your head around. The sequences, barriers, sleep strategies, producer, consumers, ring buffers, and it kind of goes on. Threading models it imposes on you. Allocators, I think, or, but anyway, so um, it is an extremely complex beats. It's tried, it's been designed as one queue to solve all problems. So that was a real problem. I was looking for something simpler. I wrote one something called FastQ. After I think a couple of months, I could get it working. Now we're dealing with lock-free queues here. Disruptor is a lock-free queue. After a lot of effort, I barely managed something that could support a single producer, a single consumer with 31 million per second. And I realized to take it to multi-producer support, it was maybe a year's worth of effort to get some reasonable performance and be semi-sure that it is correct. Because it requires very deep uh, expertise with the language, the JVM, and the, the CPU, cache lines, and so forth. You have to look at memory alignments and all sharing and a lot of things that we normally don't bother about. So uh, fortunately, somebody had written something that I could use. And I discovered JC Tools, and um, they have separated out the use cases of single producer, single consumer, and multi-producer, single consumer, and all these combinations into separate queues. So very simple interface and very good performance. And it comes from some really uh, sharp guys from Azul Systems who build JVMs for a living. So you can see they had pretty good performance there. As I varied the number of producers, it still managed to sustain some decent throughput. So now the question is, 
if that's how fast things can go, how fast are the you know the common um, well-known engines are doing? ACA, which is a framework for um, a basically high performance, uh, or at least they say high performance, but uh, it's a framework for message passing kind of applications. And these numbers, I've captured it from their own blog, so these are not numbers I have run. So I'm just taking whatever they have claimed. So the ACA number they have published as 50 million per second using 90 to 100 threads. That, if you put, if you look at it in isolation, it looks good. If you look at it and put it in perspective with the hardware, that's clearly not impressive. You can, you don't need that many threads to get that throughput. Uh, on the Flink website at the time, they said 1.5 million per core. Apex said 4.3. Gear pump with four nodes was 18. Uh, so it's quite clear the gap is big. So when I discovered this gap in streaming systems or message passing systems in general, uh, I wondered how is it on the batch side. Interestingly, somebody had done a similar analysis on the batch systems. So what they have on the left is the, uh, these are the different engines they tried with and the number of cores they used, and these are two problems that they tried to solve with them. On a laptop with a single core, with a hand-coded, uh, basically, solution to the problem, they could solve the same data set with 110 seconds, with Spark and all these other library um, engines, with 120 cores, it, you know, it took all these uh, different times. You can see it's much higher. And then they wrote their own distribute like a multi-core solution, and they were able to bring it down to 15. So this is a very nice. There's a YouTube video on this. I encourage if you're interested to, if you're interested in distributed systems and performance, to take a look at this because we are seeing that there's a rampant problem in terms of um, that's kind of a bl blindsided by not knowing what the hardware can achieve, right? There's a Unix, Unix paper as well, but you can uh, get the, um, the YouTube version, which is easier to read. So they've done through multiple problems of this nature, I think, if I recall correctly. So a quick quote, kind of very relevant for performance and resource utilization is basically can have the second computer if you know how to use your first one. <laughs> All right. So what were the principles uh, for the Storm 2 design? Most problems are kind of bucketed into either architectural issues, implementation issues, or configuration issues. Uh, particularly for streaming systems, I think these are the major architectural issues to get it right, to get good performance. You need a very solid messaging subsystem. Uh, in my view, bounded queues are better than unbounded ones because they don't need to grow, resize, or allocate on every uh, insert. These really allow you to go as fast as the hardware allows you. Lock-based queues don't bother. Excuse me. Uh, look for lock-free or wait-free queues. And back pressure model is very critical to sustaining good performance when the system is under stress. Threading and execution, avoid unnecessary threads and locks. Simple idea there. Less synchronization, the better. Uh, prefer to use uh, dedicated threads for your operators instead of having a thread pool which is dynamically assigning uh, threads to the spouts or bolts on a neat basis. That just trashes the cache. Often many thread pools are lock-based to begin with. Um, communication distance, a very key idea. Uh, communication distance is how cheap is it to communicate. Basically, within a thread, it's very fast to communicate between methods, right? It's very fast, even if you use a simple um, queue there. If you're crossing thread boundaries, in messaging between threads, that's slower significantly. Interprocess is even slower because now 
you have to start serializing, deserializing. Uh, and then finally, interhost communication is the slowest. This idea is similar to the memory hierarchy that we have in for CPUs accessing memory. And in my view, this is one of the most important ones. But surprisingly, there's at least one uh, streaming engine out there which claims to be high performance, which I think gets this wrong. So for streaming, they are actually doing one thread per process and uh, you know, basically paying the cost of serialization every time two operators need to communicate. So it's a very fundamental design flaw in my opinion, uh, but very important for distributed systems to keep this idea in mind. Lowering GC pressure and um, reducing cache faults. You can do some amount of the first one in Java, but the second one is pretty much a very clear, nearly impossible. It's possible, but I think uh, extremely difficult to achieve. We only focused on the first two, the messaging system and the threading model uh, for the 2.0. Yeah, I'll skip over the law free and the weight free queues. Architecture. So what's going on here? Uh, so now I'll talk about what changed between Storm 1.0 and 2.0 in the core engine. So this is the messaging subsystem and the threading model, which are kind of in, uh, fairly tied. So this is actually how the Storm 1.x uh, worker looks. The box on the left, that's one cube in the process, in the worker process, which is accepting all inbound data. Then there's a bunch of operators. So the center pile of boxes is basically the operators running on that worker. And the, the box on the right is the outbound data going to another worker in the uh, job. So there's one of each on the left side and the right side in the process, and there's multiple of those boxes in the middle. Each box in the middle is basically one instance of a bar, spout or a bolt. So let's assume there's just one bolt in this uh, worker. It has a receive queue where it receives the messages for that instance of the bolt. Uh, the green, well, this box here, that's actually the bolt logic that you've written, a transform, a filter, in my case, the image processing, uh, whatever logic. Uh, so that whole, uh, this is one thread, basically, this arrow coming here, going out. It goes into this box here, which is uh, outbound queue. Uh, then that gets drained out by a send thread and goes either to another bolt in the same process or to an outbound uh, uh, outside the worker to another worker. Uh, now I'm just going to I've just zoomed into those two queues, the receive queue and the send queue from the previous one. So you see these two queues here, the receive queue and the send queue. So I'm just going to zoom in to see, show you what's go, what was going on there. So over here, uh, the, when there's an incoming write happening in the black thread, that's basically pushing data into an array list kind of a thing, which is to batch things up. And then it would get emptied into the disruptor queue in one go in a, in a single batch. And if this queue was full for whatever reason, it would go into a side list called uh, an unbounded list on the side called the overflow list. And then uh, the flusher thread here would periodically drain this out on a one, se um, one millisecond or some kind of a frequency. So here you have the bolt executor, which is actually uh, draining the messages, processing them, and sending it to the send queue, where the same kind of a jazz happens all over again. There's a batching and overflow and a flusher thread, and uh, it, and it finally goes out. Uh, the going out happens through the send thread. The send thread has its own set of complexities. Uh, in a sense, it's basically trying to do the routing local versus remote. And it's bucketing those messages by the destination ID in a hash map, and then they kind of go out. They go out either into the local process, meaning another bolt, or they can go out to another process in the same job. 
So in the 2.0 architecture, we have simplified this. We have knocked off all of these things. So we've got rid of the send queue completely. With the send queue gone, the send thread is gone. So all of this goes away. Um, the flusher thread is also gone. And along with it, the overflow queue is also gone. So what you're left with is just something as simple as this. right? So efficiency comes from simplicity. Um, at a high level, at least. So, um, so all that happens is now the black thread, which is the publisher, is writing to the current batch, and that's getting dumped into uh, the uh, the JC tools queue. So we've replaced disruptor with JC tools, and then that's uh, draining into the bolt. Uh, the bolt is basically reading messages off of its incoming queue and directly writes it either to the uh, outbound uh, workers outbound queue or a lo another local bolts in, in, in input queue. The uh, question is, did you get rid of the unbounded? Yes, we did. There's no more unbounded. Everything is bounded here. And actually, that's a very fundamental design. You'll see why that, um, because it, uh, the back pressure model is built on top of that. We'll, you'll see the benefit of that. So the problem with the unbounded queues is they just can keep growing. There's no limit, and then the process can crash. Um, so back pressure. Um, so back pressure, um, there are a few different models. Uh, of back pressure, we designed one for, I can't even say it was designed because it's fundamentally so simple. Um, the, but the back pressure model uh, in 1.x initially it didn't have one. Uh, it had just something called as a max power pending which could keep track of how many outstanding messages there are if acknowledgments are enabled. And it would just make sure that only a certain a thousand or whatever number you configured, those many messages are being let into the system. But it finally got a back pressure system, which was inherited from JSTORM with modifications, which itself inherited from Apache Heron with modifications. Uh, the basic idea there is, uh, to put it simply, is that if there's any single bolt in the system which is experiencing back pressure, meaning it's backlogged, uh, you you shut off all the spouts right away. So basically, the spouts go from full throttle to zero. And there's some way to kind of uh, signal this uh, between the spout and the bolt. It used to be with, through ZooKeeper for Storm. Um, the problem with this approach is the throughput goes from top speed to zero. And then once the pressure releases, it has to work itself up. So the throughput is very, very choppy. So if, you get your, if your system is able to achieve a certain level of performance, under back pressure, it actually goes much slower. So the backlog actually builds up. And then there is this zookeeper-based communication and other things. I think in Heron, they don't use zookeeper. They have a different system. But fundamentally, uh, the problem with that is they're just cutting off the spouts. And the performance degrades pretty badly. And I will show some evidence to that a little bit later. Aka proposed a way to do this. And also, it's part of, I believe, some kind of a reactor stream standard in Java, or at least a proposed standard. The idea is that the downstream uh, to prevent back pressure, the downstream operator will send the upstream operator some amount of quota requests. So basically, it'll say, you can send me a 1,000 messages now. And the upstream will only send as many. So that way, you have a regulation mechanism. But the problem is, if you have multiple upstreams, then it's very difficult to gauge how to distribute this kind of a, a quota. Uh, Flink uh, also has a decent back pressure system. They, they it's, it's done a little differently. They do 
kind of uh, like there's a finite pool of buffers within the worker, and if they, they run out, uh, if one of the workers is backlogged, then the buffer basically is kind of right now all allocated to it, so you cannot allocate new buffers, and uh, that kind of creates an indication as a back pressure to the upstream uh, operators. That's all within the worker. So essentially, everything stalls within that this thing if one of them uh, stalls. Across workers, they have a two-way communication where upstream is sending, I have so many messages I can send, and the downstream is in response sending, OK, you can send me so many. So there's a two-way kind of a communication going on. So for Storm 2.0, we have actually a very simple mechanism. So within the worker, uh, if you recall, I was pointing out that we eliminated unbounded queues and we we're working with bounded queues. And this is basically computer science 101. If you are not able to insert into a queue, you fail, right? Producer classic, producer consumer, uh, you know, interview question you ask probably in some of your job interviews. So all that's doing is the upstream guy is trying to write to the downstream queue. He can't, so he backs off. There's no need for additional communication there. Very simple, right? So, so this mechanism is synchronous because it's happening in that same thread of the producer. And it is non-blocking because when he can't, it kind of returns a false back to the caller. So it's kind of, it can go do something else. For example, the spout, if it is trying to emit to a bolt, and the bolt is backlogged, the spout can go process incoming acknowledgement, act messages, acknowledgements, right? Or metric uh, messages. And then it can go retry to see if the bolt is again ready to take uh, new, new messages. So very fundamental idea, very simple, trivial to implement, almost uh, very few lines of code, really. And this mechanism actually is able to sustain very good throughput even under back pressure. But between workers, uh, basically, if the downstream worker is backlogged, it, uh, when it receives a message to one of its backlog tasks or operators, it just sends a response to the caller saying that, hold off. I will let you know when, the, when it's freed up again. So the, the sender uh, stops sending messages to just that task, but it can still send messages to other tasks in that downstream worker. Uh, so this kind of, uh, so again, so it's not a two-way communication, just a one-way communication from uh, downstream to upstream saying that either hold off for now, I'll, and then, okay, now you can send me uh, more messages. So yeah, so that's, that's basically it, very simple. The idea is you want to bubble up the pressure. You don't want one task blocking others. You kind of like in a you know, natural uh, flow, either of a fluid or a traffic, you want the pressure just to bubble up in that uh, flow of uh, messages. Uh, question? Yeah, you had mentioned earlier in the old design, if you had uh, back pressure, you tell the sprout to shut off. But in the new design, you tell, you return false to the sprout. I was just wondering what the distinction is in terms of uh, ramping back up to the Right, so basically think of like you have a chain of five operators. The fifth one, let's say, is backlogged. So the fourth guy detects that. The fourth guy, so if it's within the worker and outside the worker, there's two different, right? So within the work, assuming they're all in the same worker, the fifth guy just decide, realizes that the downstream guy can't handle more messages, so he backs off. Now that causes a backlog in his own input queue. So now that cascades back to the fourth operator, and this keeps cascading all the way up to the spout. Right, so it's a bubble up model. It bubbles up from the leaf to the root. Across the thing, if, if let's say the fifth operator was and a different worker, and it's backlogged, it's basically going, uh, the, the, the upstream worker process is going to get a message saying that hold off. And he's gonna stop sending messages to that guy, 
And then again, it bubbles up within the process, assuming the remaining upstream three are in the same process. So it's basically a bubble up model. It goes from the leaf all the way to the, the root. And it can be like a multi-branched uh, kind of a tree, the flow. So in this case, uh, the reason why the performance is not choppy as in the old design is because it, during the bubble up process, you might actually hit a node that is not experiencing back pressure and then you won't have to shut off the sprout. So basically everyone keeps retrying to keep pushing more and more. So let's say if this down one stream, one downstream spout is slow, he's, uh, it's not like his, his input queue is still full. Once he, as, as his, you know, he incrementally drains his queue, new stuff is getting pumped in. So it's never like a zero, okay. right? There's always data moving as long as processing is going on. Okay. So everyone's input queues are full, uh, ready to uh, for them to drain it. Okay. But if you're like, your destination is not responding like a HDFS sync or something, then the back pressure will simply stall everything because the back pressure will bubble up and then the spouts can't turn it. Okay, I have three, four minutes. Let me try to. So let me talk about some measurements. So uh, Storm is known for its latency, but I think this time we've gone super low latency. Uh, so these, is, these are micro benchmarks to measure the messaging speed. Um, uh, so how fast like a spout can emit to a bolt, right? Uh, so with one dot, uh, one dot X line, I think with one two one two three, you could achieve. Uh, now this has been tuned to get low latencies, just to because that's what you're trying to measure: how low latency can we achieve? So with one two three, you can see we achieved about 60 milliseconds. At uh, the throughput being sustained at that point was uh, a little under 300k. With 2.0, we basically uh, we break the nano, you know, break the micro one microsecond barrier, and now we're into the nanosecond territory. And at the same time, you can see there's a spike in the throughput. So huge uh, difference there. And now this is with hacking enabled, right? Because these messages, uh, it's easy to track latency with hackers because there's an inbuilt latency uh, system there, latency measuring system in the hacking model. I would suspect it's even better with hacking disabled. Uh, for sure, the throughput will go up. With two workers, that means you're crossing worker boundaries. Again, the latencies are similar, um, but you can see the throughput doubled. Uh, finally, the, okay, not finally, but I think I have a couple more. So looking at throughput now, we are looking at how fast we can push the messaging, uh, a spout emitting to a bolt. Uh, we went from close to 2 million per second to close to 9 million per second uh, within a worker and across the workers from 1.8 to 4.5 million. So, um, and actually there was very little tuning done on the cross worker uh, communication. Most of these benefits just came from optimizing the messaging within the worker. Uh, Having said that, uh, I believe there's still a lot of headroom in the messaging subsystem to take these numbers further, um, because I've measured how fast you know the things underneath can uh, move. So there's some stuff around it which sometimes tends to slow things down. So this is I've got a couple of other topologies. Uh, one is an ATL style topology, which is going to lowercase the word. So basically, the spout. Uh, emitting strings, and then the strings are being emitted to a bolt, which is uh, doing a filtering to see if all the characters are al alphabets. If not, it drops them, and then passes on to the next bolt, which is basically going to lowercase all of the alphabets there. Uh, so basically, it's a single spout with two downstream bolts. Uh, with Storm 2.0, uh, we got a much higher throughput again, 4 million something. Uh, actually, Storm 1.3 could not handle this. Uh, I'm sorry, Storm 1, 2, 3, yeah. Uh, because uh, there's no back pressure model, so the, the problem I was discussing earlier kind of kicked in. 
uh, where the message is growing unbounded and you know the memory overflowing. So then I measured this against plain Java, like you know how do you um, how does that compare with uh, plain Java implementation? And um, uh, basically, you can see the numbers are fairly close. Tom 2.0's words per second were fairly close to the Java implementation, uh, which kind of tells you, OK, not bad. That's the uh, overhead we can pay. I also did some measurements on the watts consumed, but I think Storm 1.0 uh, had some uh, crashes, so the, the, the wattage measurements were off. So we did get close to hardware speed here uh, when we we're doing single process. And uh, finally, the last one here is uh, word counting. Spout is emitting words, and then the downstream bolt is basically uh, just counting them. And in these cases, I've not done any tuning. Those are just out-of-the-box numbers. Uh, here you can see Storm 1.2.3 doing 1.5 dot doing one and a half million. Uh, Storm 2 doing 4.6. Uh, here, actually, you can see Heron. I just put the numbers there because uh, here it's evident the back pressure model is, you can see the difference here. So you can see, actually, Heron, although they came to be really fast, they're actually very slow. In fact, even slower than 1, 2, 3 Storm. Uh, because most of their numbers they have published are actually measured with the pre-Apache version of Storm, which predates even 1.0 Storm. Uh, but generally, 1.3 should see this to be much faster. Here you can see the CPU actually fluctuating between 0 and 122. So this is the spout CPU, the bolt CPUs. Uh, now, this it hits 0 because the back pressure turns off the spouts. Right, so you can see that uh, fluctuation, and even the throughput is actually very choppy. If you look at the, this is kind of an average uh, uh, throughput I've shown here. So, so with plain Java, I think again we got 4.8 million per second, which is again fairly close to the hardware potential. So again, that was a good uh, this thing. Now, looking at the, so I basically just bought a watt meter and connected it to the laptop and just kept measuring uh, how the energy fluctuates. Storm 1 had 43 watts, 2 was consuming about the same, but delivering much higher throughput. Here you can see Heron fluctuating CPU because of this same issue here. Uh, it's basically going, uh, you know, you can see the watt meter going up and down. OK, so again, we achieved a pretty decent performance there, coming close to the performance. Uh, so anyway, big gains in Storm 2.0, just to wrap this all up. Uh, in many of the, some of these benchmarks, the, the last two in particular, there was no tuning done particularly. It was just out of the box. But the default tuning for Storm 2.0 is to favor latency. Uh, performance. If you are looking to tune performance, uh, there's a tuning guide out there uh, that you can take a look at, and uh, that also covers all of the new settings in 2.0. So with that, let me wrap it up. I'm not sure if I have time for questions, because questions. I think I have. OK. Hi, uh, I just have a few questions. So one of them is uh, the, the latency measured, 300 milliseconds, I think. Was it, it's average, but the throughput was different. Um, what was the reason for the difference in throughput if the latency was the same? Uh, which one are you talking about? Um, I think, yeah, that one, yeah. OK, this one. Microseconds. Yeah. So this one, why was the, uh, why was this the same, but this improved? Right, yes. So basically, I think many people think that there's a strong inverse relationship between latency and throughput. So if you lose one, you have to gain the other. But the reality is they are sometimes coupled in that relationship and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. So it's usually an implementation uh, issue. That sometimes, so if you have a poor implementation, you can have poor latency and poor throughput, for example. Right? If you fix some of those issues uh, on the throughput side, you can actually gain. 
So this actually happened uh, because, uh, mostly in my opinion, because of the changes in the, this is actually cross process. This is actually cross process. This is within the process. So we did not actually, I didn't change much in the interworker path. Most of the changes were all inside. So there are some things, for example, in the spout is now non-blocking. So even though there's back pressure, it can go fetch the ax and other messages. So there are a series of tunings which actually, I would consider them as more implementation and a few architectural that combined that uh, kind of, uh, it gave an improvement in th uh, latency, but not necessarily in throughput. Uh, improvement in throughput, but not in latency. So in, in simple words, it's not always a strong correlation that you have to lose one to gain another. You can actually improve both or get worse in both. I see. I, I, it's probably just the way it's measured. I'm not too sure because there's multi more than one thread, so it's possible that one thread's probably like, in, in the latter case, that both threads are actually working while the other one it's sort of like blocked by the other, but the time it takes for... Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, so that one actually, to be honest, to really point it at one thing is very difficult because there's right. netty buffers, there's a long chain of things, and many of them have been tuned now for the 2.0. So collaboratively, they've given us this uh, throughput improvement. I see. Uh, sorry, one last question. Um, uh, do you know the CP overhead of like having to send back all those, um, you know, queue full um, messages back to the user? Uh, to we client? don't send queue full. Oh, uh, oh, you mean in the, the under pressure? The back yes, pressure, yes, yes. So it's uh, so what happens is the wor downstream worker sends one message to the only sender that is trying to send to that task. It's not trying to broadcast it to everyone. The overhead actually was, I once just disabled it uh, and let it go. It didn't seem measurable because it's, it's not like, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a full duplex communication. So you can send while you're receiving. So there are very few, it's only when you hit a back pressure, you, you send a message and then once the pressure releases, it's sent. So the overhead was not something I was able to easily measure just by turning it off. I see, yeah, because in... Meaning the throughput, you can keep the throughput going and let the worker eventually die, for example. So if I remove it, usually what happens is this, uh, the, the downstream worker's memory starts accumulating like too much because it's not stopping and eventually crashes. It's very difficult to measure, but for the brief moments you can keep it alive, it's not um, not measurable. I see, okay, yeah, just wondering because like in a distributed environment, like not within a process, you'd have to like unmarshal it, try and put it in the queue and then fail, right? So you're spending time yes. actually doing all that processing. Yes, that and that's in less than microseconds. I see. Uh, so the, the unmarshaling and stuff because of the small, this thing, it's microsecond latencies, if not less, because you can see the amount of time it takes to send a message at very high throughputs is 300. Microsecond, so it's in microsecond territory. Okay, yeah, I, I probably I have yeah. a question, but I'll probably leave it to that. So it doesn't uh, kind of impact the main mainstream throughput, it's because it's a it's a different channel going back. Any other questions? There's one there. So in these experiments, did you um, also measure the percentage of time that's actually uh, deserializing and serializing? Oh, and especially in the two worker situation, because now you're crossing, in the one worker situation, right, you don't really need to serialize or deserialize anything, but in the two worker situation, now serialization and deserialization is gonna usually be a, the bigger impact. Do you have any numbers on like what percentage of the time it's actually doing the deserialization and serialization? Actually, no. Um, much of the focus was on the, very little focus was given to the interworker communication because as I said, it was left untouched. There's most likely room to push it further, meaning you can potentially improve that, uh, both the throughput and the latencies in the in input worker just by, for example, in the netty stuff, you can choose some other channels there as opposed to the Java and I/O channel right now. Uh, there's many things you can do there, but it was not touched at this as part of this effort. So I did not measure the serialization. Um.
Can you talk a little bit about the message size one and two, or also about reliability? Like uh, I assume from what you discussed that uh, this is kind of a topic style of broadcasting, right? Uh, so do you also have like a queue mode, like with the uh, reliability and uh, so message size and reliability? Message size and reliability. I think they're independent topics actually. Exactly, they are independent. I'm, I'm asking for those, uh, for that data. Oh, for these, yes, what, what did I use? Yes, yes. Right, so uh, for uh, these, I was trying to see what is the fastest message throughput you can get, meaning how many messages it can move. So I was not choosing large messages, I was choosing very small messages to right. put stress on the synchronization systems. So, but with larger stuff, you will probably see more problems here as this might start dropping because of the serialization uh, being different. Uh, within the process, I'm not sure because it's mostly just references being handed around. Uh, not sure, but I'm. Uh, these numbers will di differ if you start looking at the entire plot of various different sizes. Uh, Reliability-wise, these both are with hacking enabled, like you can see here. So if you disable hackers here, you'll see much better numbers. Well, you can kind of see here actually, right? So here, without hacking, you can see the numbers have gone up. Uh, I'm not sure if I addressed your reliability question. Well, so yeah. there's with and without reliability, you have both numbers there. I have a quick question. So my question is, that was awesome. So can we clap for you? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs>